Um, yeah, so my name's Abby, and I said I'm currently doing, or well, I'm just finishing up a postdoc at KU Leuven. Um, at KU Leuven, I work um, within an ERC project led by Professor Uxana, which essentially wants to look at kind of the behavior of massive multiple systems um, across their entire lifetime, and you know anything that's a gravitational wave progenitor is kind of what we want to work, work out what's going on with them. So just to give you a little bit of an introduction about me, um, I am an observer, as uh, Daniel said, and uh, essentially since I started in research, I've been looking at massive stars of one age or another, um, primarily using uh, interferometry. So um, I kind of got my start in the radio using ATCA um, to, uh, during my masters at the University of Exeter, looking at one specific massive forming star, then moved to looking at a number of massive forming stars, moving to the infrared during my PhD, where I combined infrared interferometry with imaging and SD handling and radio transfer modeling. And now I've been using basically exclusively um, near infrared interferometry using instruments at the VLTI, which is the background of all my slides and um, essentially been looking at a, ver a variety of different um, massive multiple systems, um, a few of which I'm going to tell you about today. And uh, in February, I'll be moving to ESO, Chile, um, where I will be an operations staff astronomer. Um, yeah, and hopefully we'll get to you know, work with my <laughs> uh, instruments uh, hands-on, which will be very exciting. So yeah, we've, I don't need to go through this because we already had a fantastic introduction to massive stars um, uh, earlier today. Um, but when I'm talking about massive stars, I'm talking about anything larger than eight solar masses, um, up to 15 solar masses. I'm kind of considering them B stars. And beyond that, we're talking about O stars. Um, most of the supernovae that we will look at will come from B stars. And um, also we will have you know, neutron stars coming from the B star end. And then all the crazy stuff at very large masses have coming from our O stars. But why even focus on these stars? Well, um, there's a number of different reasons. Uh, I think mass stars are very cool because of just the huge influence they have um, across a huge number of phenomena um, in the universe. Um, the feedback of massive stars is extremely um, uh, potent and powerful. Um, they provide huge amounts of ion uh, ionizing radiation. They reionize the universe when they were the first stars. Um, and their feedback within star forming regions can help to trigger or, you know, um, dissuade further um, star formation in the region, depending on exactly where they are within these kind of complex nebulae. Um, the winds of massive stars, as you already have heard, are very important um, and uh, can even be, their influence can even be felt on galactic scales with, you know, the topology of galactic super winds being influenced by the winds of these massive stars. They're, of course, supernova progenitors and also the end of life products, black holes and neutron stars are very interesting. And we had a very nice conference uh, here in Melbourne a couple of weeks ago, I think, on everything gravitational waves and all of those gravitational waves are coming from, or most of them are coming from these end products that we have of uh, massive forming stars. And also when it comes to kind of looking at you know systems like our own where we have all these complex elements which are potentially involved in you know creating uh, life um massive stars are the origins of a huge amount of them as well so everything in yellow and purple here is related to you know the process of a massive star so a huge amount of the complexity that we find here on earth originated um in the heart of a massive star and so understanding these powerful objects can help us understand a bit more about our origins as well so massive stars are cool, but um, there's a few problems with looking at them. Um, and I've kind of picked, I think, the two most annoying things um, uh, to put on this slide here. The first is that, you know, massive stars are rare. Um, we, they live very, very short lives. And therefore, you know, statistically at any time when we look at the sky, we're just less likely to see them. And when we do find them, they are just likely to be further away from us because we're, we're kind of closer to the edge of the galaxy than the centers. So, and if these things are already rare, then it's going to be harder for us to find them. And this sorry, hard for us to find them close to us. And therefore, you know, when we do find them, they're often distant and this introduces further observational limitations on how much we can learn about them. Um, one key like property of massive um, uh, stars um, is the fact that most of them exist in a binary or multiple system. So all of that influence that I talked about, all of the processes that massive stars will go through will be affected by this multiplicity because not only do we think that 90% of O stars at least um, exist in um, at least a binary system, uh, but furthermore, most of those, so around 70% of them are so close or the orbits are so short that they are basically going to interact within their lifetime. You know, they either, can either merge, um, uh, change each other's mass and angular momentum, strip mass away. And so all of this is going to change the internal properties of these stars um, and eventually their fates and affect all of those things like gravitational waves, um, supernovae and things that happen towards the end of these stars' lives. And I just want to emphasize as well that it's not all just about binaries. The further you go up in mass, the, uh, um, the more 
common, we think higher order systems like triples and quadruples become. And so obviously this introduces huge dynamical effects, much more complex than just a simple two-star system. And these also need to be taken into account if we want to properly understand the evolution of these um, stars. And yeah, multiplicity leads to very unique phenomena. Here's just one example pathway of this. So um, here we have, you know, two OB stars, for example. One of them is going to be slightly more massive than the other. It's going to swell into a giant phase before its uh, companion. And uh, when it fills its row slope, obviously material can be transferred to the other star. You can strip away the outer layers, leaving kind of like a helium type star in the center. Um, you know, as mass is transferred, you can have angular momentum transport, and that can spin up or change the rotational speed of your uh, companion. And you can really generate very, very complex objects uh, through this exchange of mass in binaries. And of course, that, as I said, is going to affect their final fate and their properties. And of course, at the end of this, you can potentially get these gravitational waves, which we have heard a lot about in recent years. So here's a very simplified, very, very simplified, <laughs> um, uh, massive stellar kind of evolutionary path or massive binary evolutionary path. You know, we know that massive stars are forming out these huge star forming regions. We see massive star forming cores. Uh, and eventually they reach the main sequence. You have your massive stellar system, which can then interact and uh, create a gravitational wave at the end um, if it's, uh, um, depending on the type of interaction that happens. And so basically I've been probing this kind of picture um, using different observations um, throughout my PhD and my current work. And I'm going to focus on, the, well, I've mostly focused on these kind of three parts of that picture so far. So looking at their formation during my PhD, um, looking at young massive stellar systems uh, or multiple systems um, on the main sequence, and also looking at the aftermath of binary interaction. And I probe all of these systems using primarily infrared, uh, using primarily infrared interferometry. And so, yeah, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a taste of what I've been doing. And um, yeah, so just to introduce infrared interferometry quickly. Um, so, you know, interferometry generally is just combining the signals from multiple telescopes as opposed to one in order to observe your source. Um, the reason that we do this is because, yeah, you can reach much larger um, spatial resolutions um, by through interferometry than you can with an individual telescope because, you know, there's technological limitations as to how big you can build a telescope. But if you put telescopes kind of hundreds of meters apart and then combine the signals, you're simulating a much larger telescope and reaching a much smaller spatial resolution. Um, however, when you do this, um, we are no longer kind of looking in image space, but we're instead thinking in Fourier space. And so here, if we have a two telescope interferometer with our telescopes A and B, they are separated by a baseline B, and this uh, corresponds to, to a projected size scale that we're probing of the source in the sky. And um, essentially, instead of looking in image space, we're now thinking in Fourier space. So um, each of the kind of points in this UV space are related to the baseline and the wavelength of your observations. And so what we try and do in infrared tree is to fill the so-called UV plane and to sample more of our uh, source and get kind of different, um, different spatial information um, from this kind of inverted Fourier plane, if you like. This means that we have different observables um, compared to standard imaging, for example. And I just want to introduce them quickly because I'll be showing a lot of plots with these in, so it's just easier if I uh, kind of break it down at the beginning. But uh, these are kind of the three kind of key observables, I would say. So um, uh, the first observable we have is the visibility. This is related to kind of the amplitude of the fringes that we're observing. So when we combine our signals from our telescopes, we interfere them, we get this kind of interference pattern. And the fringes or the amplitude of those fringes is related to the visibility. And this essentially is telling us about the spatial extent of our system. If you have a completely unresolved source, your visibility will be one. If you have a very over-resolved source, it will be closer to zero. And the shapes of these visibilities can tell you what you're looking at. So um, if you have a resolved source, like a disk around, you know, um, a planet forming disk, for example, then you can have this kind of clear drop off in your visibility. Um, and if you have a binary, well, perfectly equal brightness binary, you can look for this very um, pretty sinusoidal uh, pattern as well. Um, another observable we have is closure phase. So um, in kind of radio interferometry or submillimeter interferometry, you're able to get direct phase information from your um, e at each telescope. But because um, of the way that the atmosphere affects um, you know, the signals that we're getting from our um, astronomical objects in the infrared, we can't retrieve this because the what we call the coherence time, or you know, how long that we can successfully retrieve the signal is so short that uh, it basically gets completely smeared out um, by the variations of the atmosphere when we're observing 
uh, in the infrared. And so we have to do a kind of a bit of a cheat and get what we call this closure phase. So we're kind of using the fact that we're observing at different positions and the fact that each of the beams of light from our um, source are uh, kind of going through a slightly different uh, part, of part of the atmosphere to um, essentially retrieve an overall phase information for the source using this difference in position. So it's essentially just kind of using vector uh, analysis. You know, you're going to get a certain signal from between telescopes one and two, a certain signal between telescopes two and three, and a certain signal between telescopes three and one. And each of those has an associated aberration due to the atmosphere. And you can, and if you observe over this triangle of uh, telescopes, and you can essentially cancel out these atmospheric um, contaminations, and you can get some information of the phase of your source. And the reason we want this is because these phases are very powerful in terms of telling us about the um, asymmetry of, of our sources. If you have a closure phase, which is around zero, then you have a symmetric source. If you have something that is obviously deviating from zero, then you have something where you might have, you know, two stars of unequal brightness. You might have um, a disk that is slanted or, you know. Um, so basically, if it's asymmetric, you'll see interesting variations in your closure phase. Another phase that we can, um, what's the word, that we can retrieve is the differential phase. So instead of kind of using a spatial um, cheat, if you like, to get the um, to get some phase information, we're instead using um, the fact that um, you have a, kind of a wavelength band you're observing with with spectral interferometers, and you're using different wavelength points as references in, in order to obtain um, some phase information. And so different shapes can tell you different things. Um, a V-shape tells you about an asymmetry, an S-shape tells you about rotation, and a W-shape um, W shape can tell you about expansion um, of shells, for example. So these are kind of the three observables that we're popping up throughout the results that I show you. Okay, so let's go back to talking about you know, the actual topic of science, which is you know, massive stars, their formation and their multiplicity. And I'm just gonna talk a bit about the work that I've done um, during my PhD quickly. So here's a very simplified picture of low mass star formation that you know, you've probably seen in a hundred different forms. And um, it's a very exciting time because we know we have a nice view of kind of going from all the way down from this kind of, you know, observing giant molecular clouds all the way down to observing planetary systems around these systems through that hierarchical collapse from cloud to filament to cores along the filament from cores to disks and then disks to stars and planets. And for, um, there's still a lot of open questions, a lot of cool work to be done, but we are in a very exciting time. We're able to just view all of these kind of different stages um, using various observations. And for massive star formation, we have a bit less of a clear picture. We know that massive stars are forming in giant molecular clouds. We're observing massive starless cores. Um, but particularly, you know, whether massive stars have the time to kind of go through this complex evolution um, of their disks and, or not is still very much an open question because massive star formation happens in 100,000 years as opposed to kind of millions of years that low mass star formation happens. And so, yeah, it's always been kind of a bit of a question as to, okay, well, what exactly is happening in these disks? Because we, don't, we never get this kind of nice unembedded picture that we get for low mass stars. You know, we don't have these unembedded class two, class ones, we have, sorry, class two or threes. We just have, um, we always have this surrounding envelope of material, which is kind of providing a block um, for us to, uh, to see what's going on. And so during my PhD, I was trying to kind of disentangle this messy kind of dusty picture or surrounding environment of massive falling stars um, using multiple um, observations. So what I was using was I had um, spectral energy distributions. So these were ranging from near infrared to millimeter wavelengths. Um, and then I had, which are great, but because these SEs are quite, um, you know, you have a, you're peaking in the far infrared, you have a lot of cold material. And so it's not like you're looking at a clear cut, you know, you can't easily distinguish where the dust emission in this SED is coming from because they're so embedded and because it's so messy. So it's really useful to have kind of high resolution data to help you understand um, or put your SED into context rather. Um, I had such observations in the form of imaging data and inter interferometry. So the imaging data was around uh, 20 micron. Um, and we found that, well, essentially by fitting 3D rotary transfer models to all the right observables simultaneously, I was able to work out which, um, what observables are sensitive to what geometries. And I found that the images were most uh, sensitive to kind of re-emission uh, from cavity walls. So if we have our kind of forming stellar system in the center here, our big dusty envelope, we know that outflows are ubiquitously observed around massive forming stars. So there's going to be some channel where that outflow is kind of pushing out of that envelope and you're going to have like a cavity left from that. And what I found was that the 
kind of re-emission from the cavity wall at kind of, uh, I don't know, 1,000 AU scales was quite, was a, was a well probed by the kind of um, radial profiles that I was deriving from these 20 micron images. Um, looking to smaller scales though, the infrared interferometry was really key. So this was um, data that was taken in the N-band, so between 7 and 13 micron. And um, this was also tracing cavity emission, but at smaller scales, kind of hotter material, um, closer to the central forming stars. But also um, was able to trace the disk emission, so emission from the uh, kind of inner rim and these inner regions. And because we have two observations which are tracing this um, cavity geometry, it allowed us to kind of remove some degeneracy, essentially, and allowed us to uh, kind of hone in more on these disks and find out some more interesting uh, details um, about them. And so um, I applied this methodology to a bunch of MISOs, or yeah, a bunch of MISOs, and was able to look for some trends. So they all have this, you know, disk, outflow, cavity, and envelope geometry. Um, all the envelopes were rotating and infalling or of this auric type, with uh, infall rates of around 10 to the minus 4 seven masses per year. And they all had similar shaped outflow cavities, but with a variety of opening angles and densities. And we saw a bit more variation in the disks. So um, we had kind of a mix of flat and flared disks, but also one thing that kind of really piqued my interest but it was that I had to induce kind of substructures into the radius transfer images that I was um, using to fit my data in order to satisfy the N-band um, visibilities that I was looking at. And so there was two main kind of structures that I found. This one is this kind of weird complex like gap-like structure. And here we have kind of like a receded um, inner rim. So it seems like the material between the sublimation radius, which is you know, smaller than this inner radius, and that dust inner radius has been disturbed and something is removing it. And um, that was kind of uh, interesting. Um, I also tried to put these kind of characteristics that I found through the fitting process into an evolutionary kind of classification, just very kind of uh, basic one. Um, the way that I used this was uh, there was a very nice spectral study of around uh, 200 MYSOs done by Heather Cooper, who was at the University of Leeds. And she categorized all of these forming the massive stars into um, different types based on the presence of certain spectral lines. So the idea is you're going from uh, young to old, and the, uh, at the beginning you have strong H2 emission from shocks from the ongoing outflow activity, but you're not kind of hot enough, your central prototype isn't hot enough to be you know, um, uh, exciting bracket gamma and other interesting uh, molecules. As you go to older types, you uh, have a decrease in outflow activity, but an increase in temperature. And eventually for the uh, last type, type three, you have even the beginning of, uh, you begin to see fluorescent iron two, which is associated with UV um, excess, which means you're getting towards, you know, your, uh, the, the end of the formation process and getting towards um, the main sequence. And so I was able to classify my sources according to this. And essentially what I found was all the systems that have these weird structures uh, were older. Um, uh, than the others in the sample, and also the cavity opening angles were wider um, for these type 3 sources. And by comparing with work by Stella Offner, who I think was here a couple of weeks ago, um, she, uh, I basically was able to uh, kind of attribute um, ages to the sources as well by comparing to her uh, model grid of massive young solar objects, um, and found that they're all around 10 to the 4 years, these type 3, which makes sense if we think that massive star formation is happening in 100,000 years. And so, Currently now, I wanted to uh, kind of unambiguously confirm these substructures, and that's one thing that I'm pursuing, and I have data incoming. I want to do image reconstruction to kind of re really look at these inner regions in more detail, and I'm planning to use the instrument Matisse to do that. Um, so I should have data coming in by the end of January. And um, yeah, the idea is to not only probe unambiguously find these geometries, but also to um, get some spectral, uh, sorry, some chemical information, um, because you know, we have very nice like multi wavelength observations that we get with Matisse, but also we can probe some interesting spectral lines as well, which can tell us a bit about the, um, the gas in these uh, objects as well, and the wind activity and various other things. And one of the reasons I'm here with Daniel is because I want to try and put this all into an evolutionary context. So <laughs> that's why I need to do some hydro modeling. So for these weird substructures, what could be causing it? I mean, there's been a lot of... Um, discussion in the low mass star community about you know transition disks and whether this is related to photo evaporation so that could be one avenue particularly as these things are very you know energetic um, one thing that could be another um, potential uh, cause of them is potentially instability maybe these things are just falling apart rather than you know um, cohesive like 
uh, disk structures. Um, but um, and one way to look at that is to use our data, which is something I'm also pursuing. But another thing which ties to the work that I currently do is multiplicity, because um, uh, you know if you have multiple stars in your system, the dynamical effects of those protostars on your surrounding material can induce um, structures. And so. Uh, yeah, I, obviously I don't need to advertise Daniel's work to, to you, but I mean, it's just, this is what's kind of piqued my interest in trying to look into these dynamics, is that I want to see how the interplay between these massive forming stars and the material, how it compares to kind of lower mass work that's already been done for Herbigs and things. Look at how these fragments, if, the, if you have fragmentation in disks, how these fragments behave and how, whether they can become um, multiple systems. And also, you know, how different scales of this um, kind of interaction between circumstantial material and multiplicity feeds in. Because, you know, for low mass cases, again, we see that, you know, the presence of distance companions can cause the, um, can affect the accretion process, can affect the movement of mass within your, um, onto your uh, circumstellar disks and therefore accretion of various other processes. So, um, yes, that's kind of what I am attempting to do um, in the next uh, year or so. And, um, when we're thinking about kind of the origin of potential companions and how multiplicity feeds into this um, massive star formation process, there's also kind of the scales that we can think about um, in terms of fragmentation. So um, in the same way that you know planets can form out of disks, can we also form uh, companion stars out of disks? Now I showed those like a small fragment model on the previous slide, but we are also observing this. And so this is a nice work which was done by John Eiley in 2018, where essentially he has a 40 solar mass central protostar that's forming, but there is a bound companion, uh, which, which is around a, a solar mass, I think, which is in orbit in the, um, is just dynamically bound and in orbit around um, the central protostar within this kind of fragmenting disk. But also, this is happening at larger scales as well. So here we have two individually collapsing cores, which should, which should form their own disks uh, uh, separately, but they're still sharing this of material. And so it's likely that these two will become bound as well. And so, you know, it's core versus disk fragmentation. And this is all kind of, you know, is a mix of these kinds of fragmentation um, con contributing to kind of higher order systems potentially, or well, what dictates which fragmentation is happening, I think is a, something that will be fun to um, investigate. So um, that's what I want to say about uh, massive star formation. And now I want to move on to kind of the massive multiple systems that I've been looking at on the main sequence and beyond. So I just want to highlight some work that my PhD student has been doing recently. This is work by Emma Bordier. Um, she's been looking at the very young um, uh, star forming region. It's M17, it's only a mega year old. And I just want, I like kind of the results of this just because it emphasizes that, you know, multiplicity has to be being set at the star formation process because this is a one mega year old cluster and all of the stars that she's looked at, um, O stars that she's looked at in this um, star forming region are multiples. Half of them are binaries, half of them are triples. So something has to be happening very quickly, very early on, in order to provide the kind of multiplicity statistics that we're seeing on for O stars um, who are a few mega years old. And so you can see her result here in red. And this is also just comparing to other um, uh, surveys that have been done um, of massive stars, um, including work by the collaborative collaboration in Orion up here, and also um, uh, kind of a, a survey of 200 O stars that was done by my boss um, back in 2014 um, here. So yeah, this multiplicity is happening and it's happening early uh, is the kind of crux of this. And also I want to emphasize that this isn't just happening for O stars, it's all happening for B stars. I have recently done a survey um, of um, B stars using uh, the Pioneer instrument at the uh, VLTI. So what you're looking at here is the visibilities, which I mentioned, which tell you about the spatial extent of your system, the closure phases, which tell you about the asymmetry. And so here you can see that these um, observables are best fit by um, a hierarchical triple system. So here we have our inner binary. Here's our tertiary companion out uh, here. And I'm finding a lot of these uh, triple systems for these B stars, but also a lot of binaries as well. And I'm able to do, I've been looking about 50 systems. And so, you know, we're seeing a, a uh, change in multiplicity fraction for a field and cluster, as would be expected. And you can see the companion fraction here as well is quite high. You know, it's not just binaries, there's higher order systems here which are affecting things. And so, yeah, now I'd like to kind of finish off by kind of advertising kind of like some of the weirder systems um, that uh, we've been looking at at Live-In. Um, and trying to, sorry, I'm <laughs> trying to kind of emphasize um, how the effects of this multiplicity can really change the the lives of these systems and you know eventually the fates that will lead to these um, kind of gravitational waves and other fun things. So the first project I want to talk about is, well the first source I'd like to talk about is HR6819 
And uh, this system got a lot of attention in 2020 because, oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened here, but uh, it got a lot of attention in 2020 because it was claimed to be a triple system containing the nearest black hole to us. So um, uh, a group, uh, Thomas Arrhenius and some collaborators at ESO, they um, had multi-epoch spectroscopic data for the system. And basically what they found was that they could see the system had been known for a while to contain a BE star. So that's a B star which has got strong emission lines due to rapid rotation. And um, they monitored this system over, let me think, over, I can't remember how many years it was, but I think it was around a decade. And essentially what they found was that by looking at certain spectral lines associated with the BE star and looking at other lines associated with the B star, they detected that, okay, well, you, we don't think the BE star is moving uh, in any significant amount over this 10-year period. We think the B star is orbiting something um, that we can't see. And so basically what they thought was, right, we've got a triple system with a B star in a close orbit with a un unviewable objects and this B E star as a wide tertiary companion. And they basically claimed that the, the, this unseen companion had to be solar, four solar masses and therefore had to be a black hole. And um, however, from the spectral data alone, um, there was some con contest of this result. People were like, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a black hole. It could also be, you know, the result of a binary interaction. And so um, I collaborated with Julia Bono to sign it. Essentially what she said was that instead of it being a black hole, it's actually just the product of this kind of interaction that you can see illustrated here. So here we have um, a main sequence uh, uh, binary with two BE stars. The larger BE star is going to go through Roche overflow and feed material onto its companion. That companion, that, uh, sorry, mass donor is then going to be stripped. And so it's not going to look quite like a normal BE star anymore. And it's going to have spun up this um, uh, B star to the point where it's got these like um, emission lines associated with that rapid rotation and therefore could be called a BE star. And you know eventually this can go through some um, further evolution but essentially what Julie was saying is like what well, you know if you look at different spectral lines um, in this ferrous spectra you don't actually need a black hole you can just see that it's the B and the BE star in this 40 day binary. And so essentially there were these two theories put forward but with the existing spectral data, nothing like you know, there wasn't a definitive like winner um, between the two um, theories. And so this is why we went to spectral interferometry of gravity to try and uh, kind of disentangle what happened with this um, uh, binary system. And so here again, the observables I mentioned, we have the visibility amplitude, spatial extent uh, and our phases, which tells us about the asymmetry. And um, this was kind of like the first simple model that we tried to kind of look at the system. So um, from the simple model, we have uh, two components. We have two point sources relating to two stars. And um, uh, in one of the stars, the brightest star in the system, the, uh, the primary, we uh, have this bracket gamma line or this Lorentzian line profile attributed uh, to this star. And you can see that in the normalized flux here. And um, this kind of provided a okay-ish fit um, to the data. You know, it seems like the separation is reasonable. It seems like, you know, there are two stars in the system at kind of this milliard second scale. However, you'll notice that in the differential phases and in these fluxes, you know, we're not perfectly recreating these features. And in particular, we can see this double peak profile in the uh, bracket gamma line here, which is indicative of, you know, rotation. Um, and so, you know, if you've got something rotating, then maybe you have a disk. And so we decided to try and hone in on this model um, it was because we were dealing like basically at the maximum capabilities of the VLTI resolution and really like the highest, like it was because um, these, these stars are already like, you know, only order of a million like, second apart. And that's kind of like the limiting, um, what do you call it, power of gravity. We had to kind of break it down and make it simpler in order to, to ape, in order to reproduce um, the observables we were seeing. So in order to help us minimize on the final model, we first broke down a disk into kind of like a toy model. And so we have like a neutral component, a bread shifter component, a blue shifter component, and then another neutral component for the other star. And so we were able to get a better fit with this. You can already see that the um, bracket gamma feature is much better improved and also the fit to different Rachel phases has improved. And we used that as basically a first guess for a disk fit. And we were able to converge on disk fit as like you can see here. So um, these are just two different velocity channels that have been uh, simulated. And then you have our uh, the secondary star here and the primary star here surrounded by um, a disk. And you can see here that now the, the sorry the observables are much much better fit. Um, in particular, the uh, kind of strange features in the in the differential phases are much better, and this double peak feature is being uh, much better reproduced um, as well. 
And so essentially what that told us was that that binary system was formed of two stars over you know, only a few milliseconds separation. And also the fluxes in gravity were telling us that it's likely that there is a disk here. And so essentially um, that implied that you know, we had a BE star and a B star in a short orbit. We also did a quick check um, around to see if we could find a wide companion as the original authors had claimed and we couldn't find one. And so essentially what that kind of said was that this can't be a triple system. We, but we know that we need to have the two bright stars in a short orbit um, and that there is no wide tertiary companion that could be the B star. And so basically there's no need to have a black hole um, in the system. Um, and so that was, uh, and that was published, I think, uh, in March this year. And so the last weird system I'd like to tell you about is now kind of thinking more towards kind of higher order systems and the kind of results of what they will be uh, doing. I am going to submit this this week, so hopefully, <laughs> wait, we probably won't be out in 2022, but you know, I can cling, I can cling to hope. Um, but essentially, um, I really like the system um, because it just seems to be a really nice example of kind of the crazy evolutionary changes that can happen because of binaries and their interactions. So the system that um, I've been looking at is HG148937. This has been known to be one of the very few uh, magnetic O stars that exists. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we don't expect massive stars to have a lot of um, uh, magnetic fields because, you know, they are mostly radiative. Um, they don't have these kind of convective, large convective surface regions, which can, you know, sustain the dynamo and keep these magnetic fields going for a long time. We expect if any magnetic fields to exist for them to kind of disappear very quickly. Um, and yet, 7% of massive stars do have magnetic fields, and we're not exactly sure where they're coming from. And HD1 for A937 is one of these weird uh, systems. It was detected to have a kind of 300 gauss magnetic field um, back in 2012. And one thing that makes it unique, even amongst kind of magnetic O-type stars, is it has this beautiful nebulae um, surrounding it. So you have a lot of complex uh, features going on in here, which are all nicely categorized by Laurent Mayhe in 2017. We have a nice bipolar structure. There's some weird helical stuff going on in the center as well. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it seems that something very interesting has happened here um, for the system. Oops. And so again, I've been looking at the system with spectral interferometry. So this is data taken with gravity at the VLTI. And so we have our fluxes, these phases again, and our visibilities. And I was able to uh, look at the system in, with gravity over a couple of years, but also to include um, longer scale um, um, interferometric modeling from another instrument called Pioneer at the VLTI as well. And so you'll notice here we have again this kind of bracket gamma signature and um, I was able to attribute that to again only one star in the system and that's interesting because I mean if the basically what I find is that the bracket you can only satisfy the observables if this bracket gamma um, line is coming from one star only and it has to be the brightest star in the system I trialed having two you know contributions from each star I trialed having it only in the secondary rather than in the primary but if you want to fit the data you have to have only bracket gamma coming from one star in the system and that's strange because bracket gamma can be indicative of magnetically confined wind and so if you're only seeing that associated with one star does that imply that only one star in your binary system is magnetic well it sort of does so in order to learn more about the system, I combined this kind of um, uh, data, the interferometry data with spectral data that was already um, been used to study the system. And so each time you observe with interferometry, you know, you're getting the separations of your stars. And so after observing for like, you know, uh, over a nine year period, you have quite a bit of like spatial information about where the stars in your binaries are. And combining them with radial velocity measurements um, from spectroscopy, we're able to converge quite nicely on an orbit. The orbit has to be quite long. It's around 20, 25 years, um, and it's eccentric, nearly uh, an eccentricity of 0.8, with a total mass of around 56 solar masses. So these are really two big O stars um, uh, in this um, eccentric uh, binary system. And <coughs> uh, to learn a bit more about the stars in the system as well, we did atmospheric modeling. So we used the archival spectral data, we revisited it, now knowing having a good handle on the orbit from the uh, interferometric plus spectral uh, data fit. I we were able to get some properties for the two stars in the system. And um, what's interesting is that one is slightly more luminous and one is a different temperature to its companion. And so if we just plot these on the HR diagram and you have these, uh, the lines here, the dashed lines here, sorry, are uh, different isochrones with red for the secondary and um, gray for the primary. It seems that these two stars, are, well, the primary star looks younger than its secondary companion. And that's very strange because this system is not in a region that's crowded. There's no other O stars near it. So the idea that it could have just captured this 
younger star is very unlikely. Sorry, this well, one of the stars could have been captured is unlikely. And so, you know, what could have changed the, the physical properties of this star to make it look different from its companion, um, which it most likely formed with? <coughs> well, uh, we uh, decided to have a look about this, and uh, we decided to see whether a uh, stellar merger essentially could explain not only the generation of the magnetic star, <coughs> but also um, the rejuvenation that we're seeing as well. So some work by Fabian Schneider uh, a couple of years ago already showed that a B field could be generated um, in a merger for the, star, for the system's Tausco. You know, you, the shear of the two uh, cores amplifies magnetic fields, and then the subsequent mixing of the core, the material in um, the merged star, like leads to fusion, which makes it look younger as well. And of course, Yosuke had a very nice paper on Eta Carina showing that again, this you can have a huge ejection event associated um, um, with massive mergers, um, massive stellar mergers as well. And so because we already had this big nebulae, HD 13937, we were like, okay, well, perhaps this system has also formed um, from such a merger. And so we got in contact with Fabian to have a look at whether this was possible. And it seems like it is. Depending on the specific uh, nitrogen enrichment that we use um, in the models, we either have, um, we have kind of two sets of uh, parameter spaces for the mergers which could, uh, which could work for this system. So it seems, to have, it seems like it has to be quite an unequal mass merger in order to uh, uh, create the kind of um, properties of the magnetic star that we see today. But essentially we, what we found is that um, the mass loss during this um, potential merger matches with the uh, mass that has been predicted for the nebulae. And also um, the uh, rejuvenation, the, the, or the kind of age difference that we see between the secondary and the primary can also be reproduced um, by this um, uh, by this kind of merger of the system. So what that basically implies is that this system was a hierarchical triple, um, uh, or some form of triple, and then um, at some point two of the stars within that system have merged, and that's induced this magnetic field in this what we now observe as a primary star in the binary, and that's why it looks so different to its um, companion. So that's kind of all I wanted to talk about. I hope I've convinced you that uh, I don't know, massive stars are doing lots of interesting things and uh, it's fun to investigate them. And um, yeah, I think uh, higher, if you're looking to characterize a strange system, I can only advertise spectral interferometry as a nice way of getting kind of this very detailed spatial information about these systems, but also, um, you know, learning something about their properties as well. And uh, yeah, the future's bright. We still have a lot to learn about um, when it comes to detecting um, the origin of companions or proto-companions and understanding how we get from this messy circumstellar environment um, with all these different kind of dusty components down to these kind of interesting multiple systems that we have at the end. And um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, so, so on the mass model, it's really interesting. Uh, can, you, can you just have rejuvenation from simply mass, mass transfer? Yes. So if it had just come from mass transfer though, we would expect the secondary to still be like filling its Roche lobe, and it isn't from the properties that we derive. So it can't have been that. Because, I mean, assuming this is recent, right, because we, if the magnetic field's still there, it should have happened recently, and if it happened that recently, then it should still be filling its Roche lobe, and it isn't. Can you remind me what the mass is? Yes, so the masses are 29 versus 26. So, yeah, both, both definitely on the, like, both clearly O stars, yeah. You, you mentioned that um, uh, these massive stars are embedded in, in uh, uh, clouds of uh, that are still very dusty and, and things are very obscured. For how long do you do, do things remain highly obscured in these uh, star forming regions? Until the main sequence, because these massive stars form qu quicker than the dispersal time of the, the natal cloud. So they will reach the main sequence, only when they are then uh, producing significant feedback will they clear away the dust that they formed out of because yeah it just the dispersal time is too slow compared to the formation time scale of the the stars themselves so but then the the, the cloud I mean, you, you clear away the dust but then you still have this uh, uh molecular or these neutral hydrogen clouds uh, sitting around are they getting in the way or uh, uh not to the same degree no but um yeah it's uh yeah, I mean, you will still have surrounding gas and they can interact with that, especially if it's you're part of like a big star forming region or not like or a cluster, for example. But I mean, 
yeah, it's still around, I guess. Questions about about the last system. Mm -hmm. So, if this was a really indeed like a merger, is there any way to constrain it from some spin down or whatever? How long ago that that, that merger occurred? Well, so we did a, like kind of a back of the envelope calculation. So, did I have? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there is some. Uh, so doing like a very simple kind of we know the extent of this bipolar nebulae and also um, there is archival um, giraffe spectra that was taken of the system and so we have like you know we measured the velocities of the H alpha line in each of the lobes and then um, kind of working backwards from that and the observed separation we find that it probably had to have happen 33 kilo year ago so recent yes <laughs> Which it makes sense with there still being a magnetic field, it hasn't been braked yet, if you like. Can you extract some, maybe even pin down, maybe even more the time scale just by having the strength of the magnetic field? That you know it's like 100, 300 doubts, right? Yeah, I hadn't thought of that actually, um, but essentially it's not something we tried to do. If it, if it was 33 kilo years ago, still like a thermal time scale, less than a thermal time scale before. I would expect <coughs> the merger product to be very overluminous, and uh, so maybe the <coughs> inferred masses, or the dynamic inferred from the orbit is Yeah, yeah. So the combined, yeah, so we get the total mass from the orbit, um, which is around 56 solar masses. And then when we did our atmospheric analysis with CMF Gen, which is how we got the properties of the individual stars, we were iterating over the semi-amplitudes of the of the lines, and so then we derive the individual masses using that total mass and the the CMF Gen fitting. It's not an eclipsing system. Sorry? It's not an eclipsing system. No. So I expect the overluminous star to be like sort of messing up, might mess up the analysis a bit because okay. we're still on regular stars. <coughs> So, bu, 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 bu. yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, there's a, so how much more luminous would you expect it to be? Um, well, it depends on what the major components were. So, yeah, if the mass ratio is quite extreme, then it might not be too much. But... Yeah, so for the potential um, merging components, um, so basically, um, when we were looking at the, we're doing the uh, atmospheric analysis of the two stars, we were able to determine the enrichment of the secondary because it's not contaminated by these magnetic lines, but we couldn't do it for the primary. So we had, uh, we basically considered both cases in the analysis. That's why we have these two different spheres of potential merger models. So this is no nitrogen enhancement considered for the secondary, and this is including it. And so in the case where we are considering the nitrogen enrichment, the, it has to be a very, very unequal merger, like. You know, yeah, a few solar masses onto an O star, um, but then. For is there any constraint on the relative inclination of the inner binary and the and the and tertiary coming from like the, the nebula, like assuming it's launched more or less perpendicularly to the, to the plane of the inner binary? That is a good question. Um, so this is the current orbital inclination that we have. And then comparing that to the orientation of the nebulae, yeah, they are quite misaligned. So it potentially is quite a chaotic um, exchange could have happened, maybe. So the, the binary is sort of uh, quite, quite edge on. Wait. Uh, yes. Let me just get the number back. Yeah, like 84 degrees inclination for the orbit. Um, I don't have the number specifically for the nebulae, but I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to say something because I, I don't know it for sure, but yeah. Maybe, maybe you can also look on the magnetic field. If you have like a measurement for the dipole, maybe you can also measure its direction. So maybe the dipole could, could infer of the, you know, of the orbit of the past uh, collision, for example. We do think that um, the rotational axis and the magnetic field axis for the primary are misaligned because we also had test data for the system. So you can, you know, you're looking at the, uh, and we see two periods basically from the system. We have um, 
a one day period, one and a half day period, and a seven day period. And so it seems like, based on the rotational speeds we derive through the stars, that there has to be some misalignment for the primary because we're seeing, we're seeing like the, the signal too often. Like it's like kind of double, twice as fast as we would expect um, given the rotational speed of the star. So, but we could definitely look into that in more detail. It could be cool to do, I think. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, Abby again. Thanks for having me. <laughs>